cup and go all the way from the cup to the neck of this bone here. And uh, then there's a few muscles that surround that as well. Um, but it, it can be part, you know, the head, the ball here is only partially covered by that cup. So there are people that just can spontaneously dislocate a hip from trauma, but uh, what we worry most about is, you know, how does that not dislocate after surgery, which we'll get into. There's the cartilage end on the bone here, which is virtually the same as on the, the end of that knee joint, or on the bones of the knee joint. So there's a cartilage surface, and then there's a cartilage surface on the inside of the uh, cup. Now, a few of you here were, were here for the shoulder, and I'm sure Dr. Nelson talked about the labor because that was the question. Uh, and that slap. Uh, is a tear in the labrum of the shoulder. But what we now know, it's probably only been maybe the last maybe eight to 10 years, is that on hips, there's a gasket, I call it, so that people get it kind of understood, but it's a labrum, and it's on the perimeter of that socket. And that can get a tear in it, and that leads people to have to start the onset of arthritis. It, it becomes painful. And it's the same kind of idea as what happens in the shoulder. Uh, we just had, we've known about it in the shoulder for way more years than we've really known about it in the hip. So that's kind of an interesting point for us. Uh, you guys are learning, so hopefully you can retain all this. There's hundreds of uh, different kinds of arthritis types. Um, most of what we see are the degenerative arthritis. That's kind of what's discussing where the cartilage bone ends thin down and, be, and expose bone. But there's certainly lots of arthritis that people know about as rheumatoid arthritis. It's a different process, actually. The, the body is sort of fighting uh, the, um, uh, uh, it's a reaction. They're fighting the, the cells of the lining to joints. And that leads to uh, the, the cartilage being uh, much more soft uh, and inflamed as well as flaking off. And so it, and it gets eroded away. Uh, so it's a much more violent process. Uh, lots of people are going through the uh, arthritis. They, they uh, are telling us that um, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years, the number of joint replacements will double. And we're already doing somewhere around 3 million level in this country per year. Uh, that's a wear and tear we got off that. So Why is that? A um, couple of reasons. The uh, baby boomer age group is uh, now getting to the point where many of them are going to be in the joint replacement uh, time frame or age group. Uh, and the other is that I think, this is kind of personal thought, but I, I, you know, I, I didn't bring it up myself, but I actually read it, is that there's, there's been such good re, uh, results from the hip and knee replacements that People, even in my age group in the 50s uh, and 40s, are ending up having their knees replaced because the quality of life improves. And you can't really say a lot of surgeries can improve your quality of life. Uh, and these knee, knee replacements, hip replacements, even the shoulder replacements can put you back on the path of being you know, fairly active uh, and uh, productive uh, working. So uh, there's, there's actually a, a subset that, you know, 10 or not, 15, when I started in the business 15 or 20 years ago, they told us, you know, don't, just hesitate as long as you can on anybody under 65. And then it went to hesitate as much as you can on anybody who is under 60. And that has led to really, uh, that's not being taught at all. So we, still go off of the exam, the symptoms, and the x-ray or MRI or CT scan findings and, you know, talk to patients about whether or not they feel that they're ready for it. So, does that help answer your question? Well, I was just wondering if maybe the quality of food today isn't the best why we're having problems with the knees. Uh, I haven't seen that. Um, what kind of food? qualities are you looking at? Well, it's all processed, processed food. food. Oh, obesity? Obesity would probably be, be the 
secondary effect, all that. Um, well, people get obesity for a number of reasons, but yeah, we, we have a much fatter nation, without a doubt. The, the population map uh, that I saw in an article not too long ago went from the 1970s to now. And in the 1970s, the percent of obesity was in the 5 to 10 range. And, and that was only in a few states, uh, most of the southern states, actually. Uh, and now the map is filled with all of the states having at least 10%, and many are up in the 30% obesity. So your population figures are way bigger for obesity today than they were 40 years ago. 45 years ago. And that, that could very well be that we're um, having a lot more processed food. Maybe. Uh, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, so this is our price, probably what brought a lot of people in. That's uh, the uh, thing that, whoa, whoa. I don't oh, have to sneak peek at the actions. And then Dr. Nelson picture. So uh, the joints are warm. They swell, they give you pain, they may lose motion too, I didn't quite mention that, but that's the same as what it's different. That will result in, I don't know if this is a typical symptom, but it's what people talk about in the presentation for history, that they're not as active. They have to sit because they're painful. Um, so you're impaired in your lifestyle, and uh, then the joint deformities are kind of a late deal. So when the bone ends are rubbing up against each other, you get the spurring, uh, which I kind of assimilate to uh, candle wax. You burn the candle, the candle wax kind of comes over the edge. Well, when you burn out the cartilage of the joint, so to speak, the cartilage ends up on the sides and it calcifies. And so it's kind of analogous uh, for layman's terms to describe spurring as the candle wax off the candle. Uh, is trying to figure out what to do. We got Dr. Nelson there looking at me. But we basically said this, you know, you look at the history. So what are the symptoms? How is the patient's health? Uh, what's their activity level? Then you do the exam, uh, range of motion, testing if there's any loss of motion. Joint line tenderness. The joint line's where the cartilage is and where the spurs are. And so that's where the money is if it hurts. Uh, you're telling me that's, that's what it is. It's not a ligament, it's the bones that are hurt. Um, and then the joint deformities. We do x-rays, and then here's the all-important x-ray slide. Boom. So, this is pretty easy. This is a hip, and this one's normal. You've got a round end of the bone here, uh, which is the ball, and then the cup side uh, has this particular normal appearance. And the thing to look for, what we all do, I'll make you all radiologists for the day, uh, is the bone in here and the bone in here have a space between them. So what's filling up that space? Anybody got the answer? Cartilage. 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 Right. So when the cartilage is thinning, this gets thinner. When the cartilage is gone, it ends up bone to bone. <coughs> And the bone ends are raw, right? They're the ones with the little holes in it that uh, collect the fluid and then get distended and cause pain. And it grinds. I mean, it's like, you know, when, until they become marble, <laughs> the, there they're basically is, you know, a rough feeling when you work that joint. It's either the knee or the hip. You get that crackling and you get the grinding. And I've seen shoulders that do that. Lots of them, actually. Uh, so they have the same, they're in ball and socket joint, too. But they have the same big process going on. Here's another x-ray. Obviously, this is your knee. The space here and here are where those cushions lay. So you have the cartilage on the bone end, and then you have the meniscus cartilage. They're the soft cartilage or the cushiony cartilage that allows us to actually be able to pit, pivot and twist a little bit. Uh, and those often are the uh, uh, things that tear. Oops. All right. So, who's had a meniscus tear? A few of you. So we take out some of the meniscus, right? And we don't take all of it out like we did 30 years ago. 
where they made a big incision and they took a special knife and they carved out the whole thing. Because back then we just didn't know what that was for. Kind of thought it was a remnant of when we walked on all fours uh, or cruised around on all fours. And um, so they found out that those people reliably got arthritis in about 10 years if they took out the whole thing when they opened up the knee. So now we try to just trim the parts that are torn. And it may give you a number of years. I see people that, you know, we've done meniscus tears out uh, 20 and 30 years ago that are still getting by without having a knee replacement. Then there's the other half that might uh, be in that 10 year point or 15 year point or 20 year point and they're starting to get arthritis. Uh, so there, there's been a lesser process that has, I think, helped people and that's that knee arthroscopy that we trim out the meniscus with, but try not to take too much. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me why does the, where does the water in your knee come from? Great question. We didn't really talk about that. Water on the knee or joint fluid. We talked about the crack of the chicken wings and the chicken legs up. You see that glistening, and that's an it's like an oil. So our body makes oil, we call it synovial fluid, and it comes from uh, the lining of the joints. So there's a capsule, like a boot on your ball joint in the car, uh, that holds fluid in, okay? It's not uh, you know, 10 W40 or uh, anything like that, but uh, it's, it's oil. It has a very viscous feel to it. If anybody's had one of those Synvisc injections, uh, or the chicken comb injections. They're very viscous. It's a very viscous fluid. And uh, so they're trying to make the body's uh, uh, this, the fluid in the joint normal. So uh, that's made from the lining of the joint. The synovial lining makes synovial fluid. And we each have about a teaspoon of fluid in our knee joints. I've not read the numbers for uh, hips and knees. It's probably less or hips and shoulders, it's probably less. Um, so that lubricant is, is another thing that can get to be a problem. So with rheumatoid arthritis, you make too much lubricant. And the lubricant's not as viscous. So instead of a 10W40, it may be a 10W100. Is it some way you could drain it? <laughs> to drain the fluid? Not you, but I can. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and when we drain the fluid, we're probably saying, well, you got inflammation, and there, you know, we use an anti-inflammatory. Our number one anti-inflammatory is cortisone, uh, and uh, so we uh, can employ that until it just doesn't have quite the effect. So, my feeling is through the practice that you know the, that cortisone effect deteriorates uh, its effectiveness or the length of time it works for slowly but it deteriorates with the number of times you use it and, but it still works out well so this guy he's bone on bone I got the right hit the right button so this guy's bone on bone on the outside but not on the inside but this still might drive us to do a knee replacement there is something they call a half a knee replacement too. But it's probably one in a hundred of the knee replacements that we do across the country. Uh, I'd like to that, uh, mine's on the inside, not the outside. Yep, yeah, you can have it on the inside or the outside. Then what do you do? Well, uh, same thing. Oh. You might have to click resume. Which one's resume? There you go. Yeah. All right, there. So they're not after treatment. We got some people that are obese. Remember, we got about 30% of the population in this country. So we try to tell them to stop eating. That doesn't work so well. But we put them on diet to tell them that you know you got to you got to reduce the weight going through the joint. So it knees, every pound you lose is about five pounds less pressure to the joint. And the joint will have more pressure when you're doing this in a squat or standing or I'm sorry, or going up and down stairs because it's bent a little bit when you do that. So it puts a lot more pressure to the back of the knee. It's about about five pounds more for every pound that you got. So if you're 100 pounds, 
is 500 pounds to the joint. Uh, exercise, the stronger the muscles are around the joint, the better it works. So we have you try and strengthen the muscles around the joint. We do a lot more of this today than we did five, ten years ago because we, we learned that the rehab goes a lot better if people are prepared by doing these exercises because the muscle atrophies or shrinks because it's a non-use. So the exercise program that we've employed here have gotten people to be in a hospital in two or three days and have you know had their pain numbers incredibly low in comparison to what they used to be. We do a lot with medications too, and anesthesia has been a real big help to that. But um, this is not what we do in a non-operative joint. So the non-operative exercise uh, and uh, so on is, is <coughs> hopefully low impact or no impact. So what's a no impact exercise? Anybody know? Swimming. Yeah, that's great. So we don't get a lot of people swimming, but Grand Arbor's got a great warm pool that a lot of people should be looking at. Um, we do medications. We call the, the biggest helpers non-steroid anti-inflammatories, or NSAIDs. Everybody probably know that they're ibuprofen and Aleve, and you can take those from over the counter. Uh, and people don't take enough. Some people take too many. So, uh, I, but I see enough people that I would say far more take too little than too much. We can get into that. Yes. What is the a good dosage of that then? Well, um, typically I would tell you to kind of titrate it up. So that's a term that we use to see scaling it up. Okay. So, you know, with their ibuprofen, you can take that up to four times a day. Okay. So it, a max dose of ibuprofen over the counter, four pills four times a day. So it goes back. Again, history tells us a bunch. When ibuprofen came out on the market, the first pill was 800 milligrams, and you could take it up to four times a day. But that was a prescription. Nobody gets a prescription unless you're in the military or got VA benefits or something today uh, for ibuprofen. You buy it over the counter. It came out in 200 milligram tablets. Great for the pharmacy to, uh, or the, the pharmacy company. Uh, and yeah, people will you know probably just start at one or two and they say, well, it's not working, so they quit, which isn't going to help them because they're hardly at even a therapeutic dose. So then history, uh, again, Aleve came out. It was called Naprosyn. And Naprosyn was a benefit because it was twice a day, and it was more of an anti-inflammatory than ibuprofen was. So ibuprofen has actually got two properties in it. It's got an anti-inflammatory, and it's got an analgesic. It's like Tylenol is a, is a pure analgesic, and ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory. Aleve is a pure anti-inflammatory. It doesn't have any analgesic properties. So if you want to take away inflammation the best, you want to use Aleve. And that came out with a pill that was 500 milligrams. And now you can buy 250 milligram tablets uh, over the counter. And it's twice a day rather than four times a day. So it's easier to do. So it's two pills twice a day, the max dose of Aleve. Four pills, four times a day, max dose for ibuprofen. I would try to get everybody to take them with food. What I'd say in clinic is it's a pill sandwich. So you look at your meal, you eat half, you take your pill. You look at your meal, you eat half, you take your pills, and then you eat the rest, which is what mom told you to do, right? But now you have a pill sandwich. So instead of the pills laying on the side or the lining of the joint, or the lining of the the stomach, it, where it irritates the stomach lining, causes nausea and, and you know, ulcers, you've got it packed into food. The food manages to get out of the stomach and into the duodenum where the medicines are actually absorbed. And then you have less chance of irritating your stomach. Sir? I had heard that uh, a leaf is not good for the kidney, so how do you balance the side effects with the relief of pain? Largely, if you stay in the, you know, the recommended doses, you're going to be fine. Otherwise, these companies wouldn't be able to get them over the counter. So they're pretty safe medications. 
The things we are going to look at is if you're on other medications, and then you can have some issues to the kidneys with any of the anti-inflammatories. Uh, maybe Celebrex is the least active on uh, the kidneys, but it's also one that the pharmacies, or not the pharmacy, but the uh, insurance companies uh, balk at us writing for it because it's expensive. And they want us to write for the cheaper medications. Um, but there's, uh, uh, I, I guess, does that answer your question a little bit? So if, if a person stays within the recommended doses that you just talked about. Right. And the kidney, the kidney problem is usually high blood pressure. And it can be some uh, other issues or inflammation, but it's usually it increases your blood pressure. So if you if you have your uh, primary docs uh, giving you the anti-inflammatories, they'll probably say, "I want to see you back in three months or six months, and we want to, you know, check your blood pressure and we want to look at a lab." So they check that kidney function on a lab, and then if it's too high or you have other medical problems that kind of uh, preclude taking the medication, then you've got to be off of that stuff, and then you're stuck because you can't do some of the stuff. Then you're maybe doing. Uh, uh, the osteobiflex or something, you know, where you get glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, which are the supplements. So that was a nice little segue. Uh, and uh, so supplements are things that are trying to augment the cartilage in the joint. This uh, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate are two compounds that make up the cartilage of our bodies. So if you kind of restore the cartilage by taking these pills, uh, or you can, I guess, restore some cartilage by taking these pills. Uh, it's a bit of a leap of faith, I think, but you know, you take this stuff that's in a pill form, you, you ingest it, it uh, dissolves and it ends up right where you want it in your joint. It's probably everywhere, uh, but it may, may make people, it does make people feel better uh, in the early process of arthritis. Uh, we don't see enough people doing this either. That walking stick or the cane, pretty helpful to unload the joint. So if we're loading it at five times our body weight and it's starting to hurt, one of the things that will help unload that, the handrail when you're going up and down the stairs, same idea as a cane or a walking stick. Walking sticks are a lot more fashionable than canes. It's a little different connotation. There are guys in this town that make walking sticks, nice ones. Um, and then the other would be a walker. So unloading the joint, however you can do it, will help preserve the joint, keep you out of the operating room, potentially for a walk. Uh, this one I think everybody already has to do, totally rest at ice. If it hurts, you're not going to be up and moving, that's rest, right? <laughs> ice is also helpful in decreasing inflammation. So it's the inflammation that we're trying to combat for most of the stuff. Physical therapy is kind of the same as exercise, but this one they can add some other things like ultrasound, which takes away inflammation, um, something they call iontophoresis, which is a little bit of uh, cortisone cream and electricity, trying to get it into the tissues. Injections, and we've alluded to the cortisone injection, and then the synvisc is the chicken comb injection uh, that we also use. It's a hyaluronic acid if you're doing that. Yes, sir? How often could a person get these injections? Cortisone. Um, cortisone's pretty much a user-dependent type of thing. Uh, my general rule of thumb is that I probably won't give you more than three to the joint in one 12-month period of time. If we're not getting it better in three months or four months, we got to go somewhere higher on the decision tree. But that three a year can go to next year and three more? Yes. There's no, okay. Right. The, now the, the um, high hyaluronic acid stuff, the Synvis, Medicare won't pay for it except for every six months. And I think all the other insurance companies, uh, don't quote me, but I think all the other insurance companies have fallen in line with that. So it's a six month deal. And it may take four to six months for it to actually work. So it's not my first line. Um, I use it probably for the least arthritic 
joints by x-ray and by story and exam. Um, but once it gets further down the road, I don't, I don't think they're truly very great. But I have people that, that come back every six months, a couple in this room. So when do you get this joint replacement done? Well, when everything else does. When your quality of life is not where you want it to be, which is usually when everything else fails. Um, and coming in to talk to us. And figuring out what's best for you and when. These are elective surgeries. There's no emergency total joint that I'm aware of. Uh, unless you consider somebody has a hip fracture and arthritis, there you go. And then we typically will put a total joint there. But there's time. So you don't have to be so uh, emergent about it. What are the benefits? Well, I think there's probably a lot of people that would say it's one of the best things they ever did. I love it when they come in and they tell me that. Best thing I ever did. So they made the right decision, apparently. Uh, and they did their rehab. That's part of it. So I can do the best surgery. Uh, that I ever thought I did, and the uh, patient could have a poor outcome. It's maybe as much their factors than it, than it is mine, or, but uh, it could be either. So, yeah. But uh, it eliminates, maybe, maybe reduces is a better term. Because uh, some people still have some discomforts, though they're <coughs> nowhere near what they were before the surgery. <coughs> Enhances mobility. Yep, we think that's true. People are still going to have some problems on uneven ground. We haven't solved that tremendously yet. So you get out in the field and you're stumbling around, you're going to have them click a little bit more for the knee replacements uh, and yet um, not be painful. Uh, we've got the improved quality of light. So. The arthroplasty. We're resurfacing the damaged bone and cartilage. We have metal alloys that are heavy. Everybody tells me they're heavy. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a really durable plastic. It's a high grade polyethylene for those of you that are understanding that. And then some of the joints are actually ceramic. Uh, This would be a stem that you see here, but it goes in, inside the bone of the total hip. So I don't know how you can see the bone there. Uh, and then this thing is uh, inside. So we know that the bones are hollow. We use the hollow part. That's where this goes, inside. And then it's got a nice little end on it that allows the ball to go on it. This ball's not moving. It's going to move inside this cup. This. This doesn't move either, but their leg moves. I bring this one out because this is the one that they, they want to uh, get you to, to sign up with the lawyers about. So this is what we call a metal on metal barrier. And a few of you should come up and feel this. And there's good reason why we thought this was going to work because it, it's, it's really got a, a good mobility to it, and uh, yet it created problems, and so that's why the lawyers have all this commercial stuff. So do you still use that one then? Nope. This one's a metal head. These are variable so that um, this is bored, bored fairly deep. This would be a short neck. We've got others that are a little bit longer, so it makes it longer, so that's how we check uh, or how we determine with the right proper length for the leg. It's one of the drawbacks for hip replacements is to make it too short or too long. So we have a little variation through the head. This is what they call a ceramic insert to a metal-backed cup. 
and it actually would fit inside one of these other cups. But this is probably the one we do the most. This is the metal head and a plastic liner, which doesn't fall out. <laughs> this is one of my favorite cups. This has got a real scratchy back to it so that the bone actually grows into it and three holes that will allow me to put a screw in and have it fixed immediately. The stems are traditionally today pressed in and there's a scratchy area on the upper part so that the bone will actually grow into this. So you get a press fit start and then it, well, the bone will grow into this and make it rock solid for the length of the joint. Oh, this that joint. goes into your knee? This is it. I only have a partial of the knee. Oh, yeah. what, what effects does cold weather have on those? You know, that's a great question. I have had uh, a number of people that tell me that they hurt the first year when it's cold. But I don't know if the body equilibrates or the scar tissue thickens uh, or what, because they don't talk about it after that. It, it's not as frequent now as it used to be in the past, and I don't really answer that either, other than that people are just happy with their knee and they don't want to complain. <laughs> so this is a knee replacement. Um, we, we'll start with kind of nothing in there. And what we've done is we've taken our little saw and we've trimmed off the ends, just like the dentist would do to put a tooth in. Okay, maybe a few of you had a cap tooth. So there just is several saw cuts on the end. We try to preserve as much of the bone as we, as we can. We like bone. Bone keeps us, you know, upright. It's a structure we're, we're given by God. And then uh, on the top of the shin bone, we flatten this off too, so we get a better surface area uh, to stick the glue onto. And that's why these are all flat, and that there's several uh, cuts to this to keep it so that we have several areas for the glue to hold this implant in place. And so we end up with one of these on. There's different sizes for different sizes of bone, and there's another uh, lock that on. This is actually the metal here is a separate piece and it fits in there and then we have a plastic which we can change to the width that we need and then this works pretty slick. It does have a little bit of rotation um, but we want you, the reason we want you to work so hard and get your motion is we want you to be able to use the whole part of this plastic piece. So if you're just not moving very well you're going to wear out the middle which is basically how what happened with your arthritis, as you wore out the middle, typically. Some people wear out the back end, some people wear out the front end, but right now, with the so metal and plastic in there, we want you to get as much motion as possible so that you don't wear out that middle part of the plastic or the back half of the plastic. So that's the, one of the keys, keeping it for a long time. This is a kneecap, it's a button, we call it. It's a little dome, so we refresh it off the, uh, uneven surface of your kneecap. Some of the kneecaps look like a ripple potato chip. They're so badly arthritic. Uh, yes. And uh, so this one, uh, we flatten it off. We put a button on here. The button matches the groove on the end of the thigh bone, so that it moves smoothly. It doesn't click apart. So that last picture, did you just die? I think we might. Am I over? And there, and just kind of open it up for. That's pretty much the Questions. All right, sir. I was just wondering, uh, all the mechanical parts and everything. And to me, it seems like uh, the simple solution is: when are we going to invent some material that's like cart cartilage and just replace that? Well, you're, you're, you're on target. There's a lot of uh, places around the world that are trying to solve that. And there's a few in this country where they're trying to make cartilage. Uh, there's, there's a couple of places that are working with uh, uh, taking cartilage cells. So we'd have to harvest your cartilage cells because somebody else's wouldn't work for you. And that would be a surgical procedure probably. You know, scrape the tissue, put it into the dish and send it off to one of these labs and they will grow that cartilage in a petri dish 
so that they put the right nutrients in there and uh, it makes it a, a bigger number of cells. Okay, and then what the next thing is is that they take the cells and they'll fill a defect in on the bone end. So, you know, I have a true normal bone, but um, let's, let's say this is the area that's injured is up here. Then you have the cells that are packed in that defect, and then I, you know they would just fall apart if you didn't cut it. So there's a little membrane that they take from surrounding tissues, and they put that over the top, and they sew that so that it's pretty much watertight, and they will hold cartilage in that spot, and then it'll incorporate and make a harder cartilage. It's still not the true, you know, original cartilage, but it's from the original cells, so it's the next best thing. Um, but there's not going to probably be a, a injection to give you new cartilage throughout your knee for quite some time. If a person has bone on bone contact in your knee, <coughs> would scoping it do any good? Yes, but it's probably more temporary than you would like. How long is temporary, doctor? Would you say two weeks to uh, four months? Minimal then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, there was a guy when I was in residency who was an orthopedic surgeon in the city. Uh, and he would uh, go have his knee scoped every year. It seemed like. I, mean, well, I was there five years and he came and got his knee scoped every year. He had bad arthritis, but I think he limped around for several months of the year and then got his knee scoped and was better for a while, but not long. Nobody recommends serial knee scopes anymore. Cortisone shock would be a lot better. Well, it's less invasive. Less risk, and, yeah, it's all better. Yeah. Yes, sir. These? Um, people who have a metal allergy, this is a really uh, low number, but an important issue. So if you have. Um, Skin, it's very sensitive to metal. For the women, it's, you know, posts on their ear, uh, rings on their fingers, uh, uh, and they get a rash. Uh, and so there was a gal I saw in clinic today, actually, who's had two knees replaced, and we used a special covering. So this is a, a alloy of metals, mostly cobalt and chrome, or cobalt, and cobalt, chrome, and... I can't pronounce it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there was a, uh, a special set, uh, sprayed on cover for that particular knee that uh, is inert, they think, because it's oxidium, uh, or it's oxidized zirconium. So really very few people have had contact to their skin with zirconia. And so they oxidized it and they put a layer of it on the metal 